Thanks for watching Notepad with me, Ibrahim Sani. It is early March and that means that tax season is back. Taxpayers can submit their annual income tax returns via e-filing starting March the 1st, which is last week. This is, of course, uh, the year for, for the year of assessment 2018. LHDN says that the deadline for submitting Form E is on 31st March, while Form BE and Forms B and P are to be submitted by April 30th and June 30th, respectively. Taxpayers are strongly encouraged to file their tax return forms via e-filing this year, as LHDN will no longer be printing and mailing the forms in a bid to encourage taxpayers to use the e-filing system. So here to discuss income tax and the tax policy in general and more is the very esteemed Mr. Doctor, actually, yes. Dr. Varindarjit Singh, Chairman of Excel Asia. Uh, thank you, sir, for uh, having us. I think the last time we spoke must be a few years back, yes. uh, back when we were not doing TV, I suppose. Yes. But uh, the conversation, of course, thank revolves you. around this is the first time people are uh, filing the income tax for the new government. Um, and uh, are there going to be any changes or is it going to be the same old, same old? What would be the expectations for this year's uh, income tax uh, season? Right. Uh, actually, it's the same old, same old. I mean, the tax laws haven't really fundamentally changed. So it's going to be exactly what we used to do every year. Uh, and I think, as you pointed out, the timelines for filing is very, very important. And uh, for most of us who are employees, uh, end of April deadline. And those of us who have some business source income uh, will be end of June. So I think uh, in terms of the obligations, in terms of the timelines, uh, submissions, and what you report, it's all the same as it was before. Um, and of course, you take into account certain types of uh, reliefs so, um, you can get, and there were one or two ch minor changes in the last budget. But fundamentally, they remained pretty much uh, as it was. So will the impact of, for instance, GST, SST, and all these matters, are, are they going to be a matter of consideration for you know, most of us, which are employees? Uh, well, most of us, yes, if we are buying stuff, right, as we do, you know, you go to a restaurant and so on and so on, there's service tax included and so on. But again, when people ask me about service tax, sales tax impact, I go back to look at the impact that we all saw under GST. And, and pretty much because the rate is the same, it's still 6% 6 whether it's a service tax, whether it's a GST, whether it's a sales tax. Our sales tax is a bit higher. But uh, f actually, fundamentally, you're seeing the same impact. For the man in the street, when you get an invoice and you get a bill, it just replaces, uh, they, they still call it government tax anyway. So whether it's a GST or a SST, it's the same thing. So I think impact to the man in the street is uh, very limited. Uh, the only way we can measure it is the prices. Have prices really substantially come down? And uh, you know. Prices are sticky downwards. Prices are very easy to increase. Yeah, absolutely. So fundamentally, I think GST is GST, SST is SST, uh, and as far as income tax is concerned, that's being assessed on your income that you earn. So different basis on which you impose a tax. So it's not, uh, shouldn't be a consideration in your t filing of tax, income tax returns, the SST or sales tax, service tax, uh, is really the impact on the goods and services you buy and maybe a higher amount that you have to pay out. So it affects your bottom line mm. in terms of your take-home pay and what you do with it. Of course, the conversation uh, revolves around the types of income as yes. well. And I would like to touch upon the types of income for the majority of Malaysians. Yeah. Um, and um, it was first, I guess, coined by the previous minister of the previous administration saying that, you know, do a grudger. So oh. a lot of people are now getting jobs, uh, you know, is, I guess a freelancer yeah. or moonlighting, yeah. or whatever you call yeah. it. Yeah. Um, uh, you have a steady income and you have incomes that are being garnered elsewhere. Yeah. Let's talk about that uh, okay. idea first. Uh, when you look at the various types of income that uh, are subject to tax, when I say tax, income tax, it's a focus today, right? Yeah. Um, then you're looking at employment income, you're looking at business income, and you're looking at income such as uh, dividends, interest, rent. And the last part, you're looking at any, any other 
income that is of uh, continuous nature, which sometimes is called annuities, and very few will be affected by that. That's more corporates. And the final part is any other income in the categories of uh, the types of income subject to tax. So if you're looking at the, at the average person, um, employment income is very clear. And perhaps, as you mentioned, if those who may be doing some freelancing and may be earning some returns, um, that could be classified under other income, any other income, because it's not employment. It may not be big enough to be a business source, uh, but it has got some regularity. And so you can categorize it as any other income. So the big, the answer to the question really is whether you are having employment income or freelancing income, it could be commissions, it could be people who read news uh, yeah. on a part-time basis and they get some honorariums or, or, or whatever you call it, commission yeah. or whatever, right? All that is actually falling within the classes of income that are subject to income tax. But in order to be subjected to income tax, you need to cross a certain threshold in terms of total earnings in a year. The average uh, has been calculated to be around 34, 35,000 or so. Mm. Uh, it depends on the reliefs that you'll be entitled to. So the average, I think roughly it's probably 30, let's make it 36,000 a year. You definitely would be subject to income tax, right? If your earnings, employment income in your freelancing income doesn't come up to that, then you will probably not be paying in income taxes because of your reliefs and all that, you are exempt. Uh, if, however, when you combine all that, remember, you must combine your income. You cannot look at your freelancing income separately and your employment income separately. It's actually combined. So by combining that, if you're roughly crossing that particular uh, barrier in terms of threshold, then you should be looking at looking out more and understanding more about what income tax is and how do you file returns and what do I get in terms of personal release and so on. So, so well, the bigger question is, of course, uh, is it wise to yeah. not declare? Uh, I mean, you know, no, I, have a, yeah. I have a steady income and yeah. then the job that I do is not oh, even consistent right. it's once a month, whatever. We come back to this question of compliance. Uh, the law requires that anyone who is taxable needs is obligated to inform the Inland Revenue Department or the board. In this case means you register and then you start filing. So there's a legal obligation under the law on all of us. Um, so granted, there are many who may have either through ignorance or willing, uh, willfully or un unknowingly It's called malicious, doctor. Huh? It's called malice. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> unknowingly uh, fail to report certain income. And this usually happens to the kind of income you're talking about, right? yeah. freelancing and some kind of commission income, which doesn't come too regularly. So you tend to be out of sight, out of mind. It also has hap it happens to rental income. So many people conveniently think yeah. it's not taxable now. So my first uh, comment earlier was that the classes of income. So once you look at the classes of income, really, rental income is taxable. Any other income that you get, as long as you have an income nature, which means there's some regularity. It doesn't have to be every month, but this is how you make a living. And it doesn't have to be the only way you make a living. It can be a number of ways you make a living, right? You can do freelancing, you can do a full employment and so on. Um, so like you look at grab drivers and so on and so forth, right? You just have to look at the total and does it cross the threshold and you have to report. So the question should, is it wise to report? The law obligates that you report. Of so course. we, we, I think, in terms of uh, this government uh, that, is, that, that is now in power, has made it a kind of uh, very clear that the idea here is trying to everyone complies with the law and contributes to society. And in exchange, the government has to provide the right amount and level of services that we all expect from the government. So mm -hmm. I think the idea is pushing up compliance, making people compliant. And of course, trying to make the relationship between the Inland Revenue Board and taxpayers an easier relationship. Of course. Yeah. We'll take a short break, but when we come back, we'll discuss a little bit more about the types of income, including that of what we normally deem it as investment income. Don't go anywhere. <laughs>
Thanks for staying on with us. You're watching uh, Notepad with me, Ibrahim Sani. We are talking about tax and income tax. It is, after all, March. Uh, and here to join us in this conversation is Dr. Varinderjit Singh, the uh, chairman of Excel Asia. Uh, doctor, I just want to understand a little bit about the various types of income. A lot of people are now taking a little bit of uh, cognizant uh, uh, knowledge into the types of uh, income, including investment income and rental income, yeah. which is going to be considered as income yes. uh, tax. Which has always been considered. Yeah, yeah but there is there seems to be this weird perception. notion, yeah, perception yeah. that, oh, it's okay, rental income. Get away with it, yeah, yeah. Okay, so I think, well, number one, it is very good that we find that society at large are starting to wake up to be, uh, become a bit aware, more aware of their obligations. I think this is, this is a positive thing. Okay. And this is connected perhaps in some ways to the voluntary disclosure program that the No Revenue launched. So I think that was the whole objective. We'll touch upon that very shortly. Yes. Yeah. How to enhance compliance. So it's an excellent move and then the whole idea is let's keep that going in terms of education, in terms of awareness. Now, when you look at investment income, you're looking at interest income. Not many of us uh, may have that. Theoretically, if I were to give a loan to somebody and I'm charging a small interest, I'm not a money lender because I don't do this regularly, that interest that the person pays you is actually taxable. Wow, well, yeah. well, technically. Yeah. 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 Well, legally. <laughs> so, <laughs> so the second part is, uh, is dividends. Right? I invest in shares and then I get some dividend income. Now, dividends in Malaysia, however, have been specifically exempt. So we do not need to report the dividend income that we get from Malaysian companies. Yeah. Third one is the rental income, which is also investment income, right? Now, rental income probably is the one that most persons may have overlooked uh, because usually it's more substantial. Yeah. So, the, so that's a psychology here in terms of how, why, why, and why people try to avoid and not pay taxes. So? Okay. We'll, we'll talk about that if, yeah. if we have time. Yeah, no, of course we uh, don't have time the, for you. The, yeah. issue, the issue here is uh, rental income, uh, what is taxable? And in the end of the day, it's the gross rent that you get in the year. But you can get certain deductions against that income. And what are these deductions? They're usually, it is quit rent and assessment, very clear, because these are obligations. Then it is perhaps some repairs that you make. Repairs, however, we need to distinguish between other repairs, renovation related, in other words, capital or income related. So repairs like repainting, mm. all that, plumbing, the term, it's fine. Yeah. Those are considered of a revenue nature, of an income nature. So you can claim all those deductions. But it's a renovation where you extended the property, the, you know, the back, the back became a, a, mm. a, another room and all. That's capital in nature and that is not income in nature. So you can get deductions for that. You can also get deduction, obviously, for the mortgage loan interest that you pay, not the principal sum that you pay every every month. Oh. So you may pay a thousand five hundred, of which uh, two hundred could be of interest. It's only the interest that is deductible against rental income. So remember, the other portion will be your so-called principal part of your principal loan that you're paying back. It's only the interest that is deductible. So. So that's, that's about what you can deduct against uh, rental income. And then only the net is subject to income tax. So the net you add on to all your other income and you work out the formula and you come up to your liability. So, so, um, so rental income, the, the challenges are that many may have overlooked it. Yeah, let's yeah. touch about this uh, topic of, of the psychological aspect of it sure. before we go into other sure. substantive because you know me, uh, I like to gossip. Yeah. Um, why, why is this psychological oh, thingy uh, sure. you know, uh, kicking in? Even, even my, my doctoral thesis was on compliance and behaviour you know, so, okay. and there are lots of research on this. This was when US. you were back in UM? Yeah, back or? in UM, yeah. All right. um, and, uh, and the psychology of paying taxes is fundamentally the issue of deterrence. Um, if there are strong penalties, people tend to comply. If there are not so strong enforcement of this, people tend to say, I can try to let, uh, let, let, <laughs> try to take advantage. <laughs> the other aspect of psychology of taxes is that if you pay, look at psychology of people, it also has been found that it depends sometimes on gender. Uh, females are known to be more compliant than males. Mm. Second, the second aspect I've seen before is the type of income. Uh, persons with uh, business income, which is of the nature that I just talked about, if mm. it's more like 
uh, not, not wanting to point out to any particular, particular type of business, but if you're looking at sideline businesses, the freelancing part and all that, there's a tendency to overlook that uh, and, uh, and, and not report it because you feel that it might be the tax person may not go after, get you. after you, may not get that information and therefore uh, you, you feel that you don't have to. So there is a tendency among people that. Then there's also the social strata of society. Uh, and, uh, and generally, there could be those who feel that they are high income earners, they generally will report, all right? Because if you are a high exec, uh, expatriate executive here, employment income, you, you, you can't really get away from it. Um, but then it's the other business elements that, we, that people do a lot of this, um, hawkers and so on and so forth, is an element of trying to not report either through ignorance mm. or knowingly. And because record keeping is poor mm. by those kind of businesses, so it tend to sort of. Mm. So psychology here is about, in psychology, the, the research on tax compliance has shown that the other aspect that motivates people to pay uh, or not to pay is sometimes also the services that they feel that the government provides, right? Is the I'm government sorry, I'm clear on that one. Is the government providing good roads? Is the provi providing good education? You know, oh, but then that's subjective, isn't it? Exactly. Like it's my perceived idea of what, Correct. how well so the government is So if I'm paying right. taxes, I expect reciprocity. Yeah. And that basically means that the services that the government is supposed to provide in terms of health care, you know, roads and all that, uh, I should also get some fairly good type of service. Yeah. So in, in many developed countries, this research has been done and there is this tendency to say that I need accountability, right? Uh, whatever dollars I'm, I'm giving out to the coffers of the nation, then I, I want it to be well spent. So that's the other aspect. So you, you can look at uh, demographics and you can look at policy aspects and that motivates, what motivates people to do what they do. Mm. So the answer therefore to trying to curtail uh, excessive non-compliance is education, number one. And number two, it's the relationship between the agency that implements the law and taxpayers. And if the people's experience, this is again based on research, experience with the agency has been bad, then that person will ultimately look at ways and means of trying to have less contact and therefore pay less. All right. uh, so th those kind of stuff that we that is found in research in terms of what gravitates people away or towards paying the taxes. It's, it's interesting that you can yeah. make tax very very much uh, interesting. Yes. Yes. Well, but we'll take a short break. When we come back we'll discuss a little bit about the voluntary disclosure uh, introduced by the Ministry of Finance. Don't go anywhere. <laughs> Uh, you're watching Notepad with me, Ibrahim Sani. We are with Dr. Varindajit Singh, the chairman of Excel Asia. And uh, we are trying to understand a little bit better about the tax season, particularly income tax. Um, the, very recently, the conversation of voluntary disclosure was uh, being introduced by the yes. MOF. Yes. Um, uh, could you give us a little bit of update on that one Correct. to your best knowledge? Correct. Um, in fact, I just came from a seminar where we had a presentation by a representative in the Revenue Board on updating the audience on the SVDP, that's what they call it, eh? Special Voluntary Disclosure Program. Now basically this program is intended to try to be a one-off amnesty. Uh, although the word amnesty is not the right word because there is no total amnesty. There is a penalty which is low enough, 10% penalty up to the end of this month and 15% up to June, that is June. This is on the tax that people have overlooked or people have underpaid, or people who have never paid their taxes. Or maliciously absconded, I'm using strong language here. Whichever. <laughs> and uh, and uh, oh, may they want to now say, I want to come clean and let's just start a, with a clean new slate and pay the taxes, plus a low penalty of 10 or 15. Mm. This is, the motivation here is to try to enhance compliance in Malaysia. Uh, and the Inner Revenue Board has gone to great lengths to prepare frequent, frequently asked questions, to prepare various letters, and I think many have got a little bit perturbed by receiving a lot of letters. And Including so my wife, honestly, yeah. yeah. But everybody received it, so, yeah. so it's not, not that people thought that 
you're receiving it because you've been earmarked mm. or it's something you've missed mm. out. That's mm. not, not, not the case. Uh, part of the educational campaign to remind you of it and uh, that if you haven't reported something that should have been reported, then maybe now is the time to take advantage of it. Now, the Indian Revenue is taking uh, a very progressive step in the sense that we do not, if you feel that you have overlooked, especially rental income, for example, for the last five years, you've had a property and you got rental income and you never reported it, you now want to say, look, I want to report this. This is what the Indian Revenue will encourage you. You write a letter, state the, um, the, the years in which whatever the income was, this is what I want to report, I've overlooked it. Um, no questions asked in terms of please produce documentary evidence, they won't. It's all now taken in good faith and it's felt, look, in the revenue takes it in good faith, expectation is the taxpayer also has been report, is reporting the full amount, right? So it's both sides. Mm. Uh, and uh, and in the revenue then look at that, process it, give you an assessment and then you pay the amount plus the 10% penalty. So. The advantage of this is that it does not require you to provide all the documentary proof, right? It relies on your good faith to say, I have missed out, let's say, uh, 12,000 a year should have been my rental income, so for five years, 60,000, this is what I report, and please prepare the assessment under the SVDP, and in the revenue branch will do that for you. And that's the philosophy in terms of how uh, the inner revenue is handling this. So I think there's been uh, quite a bit of take up uh, I don't have any idea of the total of number collected. The inner revenue has come out with some targets, which I thought was quite uh, aggressive uh, in terms of 10 billion being recovered. But the, f the, the point to make is that I think this is a good start, but it, we, will not, we will not have this type of uh, voluntary disclosure program again, as far as I'm concerned. From a policy point of view, it's dangerous to keep having these programs I but this is like a one-time offer. This of course, it comes under extreme circumstantial yeah. Yeah. Uh, changes as yeah. well because of change of government. Yeah. But this does this tie in with the statement that you gave, you know, about five ten minutes earlier, where Compliance? the sense of reciprocity yeah. is coming in, and therefore, okay, yeah. I have good faith there yes. is a new government coming yes. in. The I now is, am ready to pay. The timing is quite quite good in terms of uh, people generally most feel that there's kind of you know in Malaysia Baru and all this kind of stuff which I have my doubts about, but anyway, whatever it is, it's always good to look at something positively. And I think it is a good stance, and I think we need to then keep doing it well. The Inner Revenue and the Customs and all the agencies need to interact with the, with the taxpayers well and be more facilitative. And I think you're beginning to see that, and if you see more of this, then I think you get more people not being afraid of the authorities. And I think that's one of the ways to build our revenue base because our tax revenue base is very narrow. Mm. Only 15%, 1.5, of employees pay taxes. I'm sorry? So only not so, so of the total work strength, workforce, yeah. workforce? Only 15% are registered as taxpayers. And of course, the workforce constitutes what? One third of the population? Yeah. Wow. So, so you are looking at a situation, and this is not doesn't mean that it does not mean that many people are evading taxes. It also means for individuals, it could be that many it's about the income levels, mm. and it's well known that our average mean income levels are low, and that's part of the reason why our base is narrow. Then you got another aspect: uh, companies in Malaysia also generally, if you look at data that in the revenue produced. It's, there are a million companies registered under the Companies Commission of Malaysia, CCM. Only about less than 20% actually pay taxes because either the companies are dormant, you can register millions, but I don't know, I think yeah. 200, 300, uh, could be dorm, thousand yeah. could be dormant. Yeah. And the rest could be either making losses or enjoying incentives. So that's the dynamics where we are. So the base is narrow and you need to now look at and making sure that the base can be widened by way of saying those who have avoided it, please come forward. So I think that's where the philosophy of the SVDP and it's uh, moving in, in tandem. The Inner Revenue has been presenting at various forums, various firms run events and they speak. And I think they have used this phrase in good faith. And uh, some people take it very reluctantly, uh, but I think it's a, new, it's a new way of looking at things. And I think we need to trust the authorities that they'll get it right and they'll do it do the right go by the 
the books in the sense of trusting and moving forward. So the other wonderful thing about all this is that if you declare under this particular SVDP and um, because of good faith on both sides, the Inner Revenue will give you a letter to say that we will not be auditing you for those years in prior. Also oh, complete uh, yeah. good faith. Good faith. And that we will only audit you from 2018 or 19 or when you file the, the current returns. Now that is quite a dramatic um, approach. Um, and this is where, but it's written in the letters that, that the Inner Revenue has uh, issued and uh, emails and so on. It actually says that. So that, I thought, is a very uh, good way of saying we'll come clean, we will not look into it. Of course, in the, in, uh, to me, that's a very, it's never been done before, right? Yeah. So I think it's a matter of trust on both sides. Okay. So that's where it's going, and I think it's a good program, and uh, we hope everybody takes advantage of it. But, but part of the other point is this program came about because there is this exchange of information among countries. Mm tax information. Mm. We call it the, um, the common, reporting, mm. common reporting system. And, uh, and so Malaysia, as many other countries, are exchanging information on their citizens, right? So if I have an account in Singapore, yeah. Malaysia ultimately will know that you have an account. And that also can lead to situations or questions, uh, where does money come from? If it's from tax money and you then paid it out, that's fine. But if it's money that was somehow not taxed in Malaysia because you did not report it and then you take it out, then you could get into problems. So this yeah. is another opportunity for those who have done this uh, may come clean. So that's what the SVDP is all about. That was my conversation with Dr. Vrindajit Singh, the chairman of Excel Asia. Remember to file in your tax uh, return according to the deadline as set by LHDN. Just visit their website for further details. That's it from me. Thanks very much for watching and goodbye. Thank mm -hmm. you.